This past Saturday night, April 13th, for the first time in history, Iran launched a direct attack against the Jews of Israel. It was a massive onslaught, around 350 weapons of destruction, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and killer drones were launched at Israel. A single one of any one of these weapons could have killed hundreds of people, God forbid. It is estimated that they carried a combined 60,000 pounds of explosives. But only about five missiles landed in Israel, causing extremely insignificant damage. It was reported that about half of the missiles were duds and never left the Iranian territory. The rest were intercepted by a cholent of Israeli and American air defense systems, the Israeli and American Air Force, with the logistical assistance of some other Western and Arab countries. If you believe that it was the incredible coordination of all these disparate forces working together with perfect synchrony, accuracy, and speed to accomplish the interception of fully 99% of the deadly projectiles fired from Iran, if you believe that narrative, I have a bridge to sell you in Brooklyn. The incredible sophistication of the Israeli army and intelligence apparatus was demonstrated on October 7th when the poorest and most pathetic country in the world, with the weakest army in the world, by far, with no planes and no tanks, and missiles made of water pipes assembled in makeshift factories and subhuman hellholes underground. So this nothing of a country called Gaza, with nothing of an army called Hamas, completely overwhelmed and outsmarted the mighty IDF together with all its brilliant intelligence units. The horror and suffering they perpetrated was unprecedented in its brutality since the Holocaust. And it was orchestrated right under the very noses of the myriad of military and intelligence units Israel has set up to defend its citizens. And now, after six and a half months of fighting, and the terrible and irreplaceable loss of 260 of our brave and courageous soldiers, Hashem Yikam Domam, plus the many thousands who have suffered terrible injuries which will affect them for the rest of their lives. After all that, the mighty IDF is not even close to destroying the enemy. Even if they end up going into Rafah and killing or arresting another few thousand subhuman Hamas fighters, still, thousands of them will survive. They will shed their uniforms and hide among the Hamas adoring population of Gaza. Within a few short years, they will recruit and train tens of thousands of young new fighters who have been brainwashed since the day they were born, taught by their mothers while they were being breastfed, and then by all their teachers from kindergarten and onward, that the most meaningful thing they could do to please the caricature of God they call Allah is to sacrifice their lives to inflict as much pain and suffering on the Jewish people. There is zero chance that the great defenders of the state of Israel will succeed in transforming Gaza into a terror-free, peaceful neighbor. They simply don't have a clue how to accomplish this, and even if they did, they don't have the guts to make it happen. Over a hundred hostages are languishing in unimaginable, horrible and torturous conditions, and the brilliant Prime Minister and his colleagues, together with the legendary geniuses of the Shem Bet and the Mossad, plus the heroic former generals of the IDF, have absolutely no clue how to get them free. The main preoccupation of the Israeli government seems to be how to open more and more crossings into Gaza by land and by sea, so that enormous amount of aid can be brought in to support Hamas and all their cheering fans, who are the so-called civilian population. There is so much food going in there that probably half of it is thrown in the garbage. But the Israeli government thinks that by bending over backwards to feed our enemies, while our own brothers and sisters are starving to death in the hell holes underneath Gaza, is a display of incredible morality, one which will inspire the nations of the world to sing in unison the praises of the Jewish people. The geniuses who run our government actually think that this treacherous behavior will earn them points with the International Court of Justice or the brilliant professors at Harvard and Yale. When in truth, the actions of the Israeli government actually encourage the world to despise them even more because people have no respect for weaklings and suckers. The Israeli government keeps on offering outrageous prizes to the subhuman Nazis holding our brethren hostage. They speak of freeing hundreds upon hundreds of bloodthirsty terrorists who will no doubt resume within five minutes after leaving the walls of prison their full-time occupation, which is to inflict death and suffering on more Jewish victims. 
and in addition to the crazy price of freeing hundreds and hundreds of dangerous terrorists, our foolish government offers our enemies additional outrageous prizes, such as removing all our forces from Gaza for several weeks to enable Hamas to regroup, rearm, and set up more booby traps to kill our courageous soldiers when, and if they do return, Rahman al But even after repeated crazy offers by the weaklings running our government, the leaders of Hamas laugh in their faces, and our esteemed leaders don't have a clue of how to proceed other than to pathetically beg the Iranian-loving Biden administration to work with their other buddies, the virulent Jew haters of Qatar, to intercede on our behalf and beg Hamas to accept outrageously disproportionate and terribly dangerous offers concocted by the clowns who run the so-called war cabinet. And neither do the leaders of the superpower of the world, with its awesome, mighty military, the glorious United States of America, have a clue what they are doing. They showed their true capabilities when they ran away from Afghanistan like little mice being chased by cats and dogs. So my dear listeners... The narrative that our brothers and sisters in Israel were protected from the Iranian onslaught this past Saturday night due to the incredible supremacy of the Israeli army and its missile defense capabilities together with those of the Americans and other Western and Arab allies is a ridiculous and dangerous fallacy. When Iraq fired 40 powerful Scud missiles at Israel during the Gulf War in 1991, over 4,000 buildings were destroyed but not one single Jew was killed as a direct result of a missile. It was not the amazing air defense systems of the Israelis and the Americans that saved them. And it was not the amazing pilots of the IDF Air Force. It was God Almighty who did this on his own. As we say in the Haggadah, My dear brothers and sisters, when you say the Vihisha Amda passage at the Seder this coming Monday and Tuesday nights with your family, get up and start dancing with your children. Tell them this is not some ancient historical tradition. This is something the entire world witnessed just a week ago. Explain to them that experts point out that it is statistically impossible, according to the laws of nature, that the absolute failure of even one single missile or drone to harm one single Jew was accomplished without the open intervention of our Father in Heaven. It is a miracle on par with the miracles of the Exodus. (laughs) Ki meit seis chomayeretz mitzrayim arenu nuflois. Micha, chapter 7, verse 15. Only this time, there was a smokescreen which allowed those with their head in the sand to continue believing that the Jewish people are subject to the laws of nature. Explain to your children that the same God who protected the Jews in 1948, when Israel had no army to speak of, and the same God who was responsible for the miracles of the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War, and the same God who figured out how to protect the Jews against Saddam Hussein, Scud's missiles, without the help of the Israeli Air Force. He is one and the same God who protected us this past week. Although this time he chose to do it under the guise of nature, allowing the foolish to remain foolish. As it says in the end of the book of Daniel, that at the end of days only the wise will understand, but the wicked will remain foolish. Now allow me to share with you some prophecies so you can understand what really went on. If you have a Tanakh, the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible available, please go fetch the book of Zechariah, Zechariah. There is no question that the long dreaded wars of Armageddon have begun in earnest. Of all the nations mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38 that will participate in an alliance against Jerusalem during this war, there are only two that can be identified because the rest of them don't exist anymore. One is the United States of America referred to as Mogoy. This identification is undeniable because our sages teach us that Mogag will be the superpower of the world at the time that these wars occur. The second nation, which is obvious from the text itself, even without any commentary from our sages, is obviously Iran, which is identified with its biblical name Paras, Persia. This is the very name that this nation has been called since time immemorial. They changed their name to Iran only in 1935. The incredible thing about the prophecies in Yechezkel and Zechariah is that they depict a situation which is completely nonsensical. It talks about this alliance of nations simultaneously working against Israel while also killing one another. Does this make any sense? It also talks about Jewish leaders joining this alliance against their own brethren. What a crazy scenario. Who can make up such a thing? I once heard Sam Harris say that if somebody could show him something in the Bible 
that only an infinite God could have written, he will have to rethink his atheistic belief system. There are tons of stuff that fit this criteria, and perhaps we'll have an opportunity to share some of them in future videos, but for now, let's focus on the subject in hand. If somebody wanted to make up a false religion together with a false Bible to go along with it, the smartest thing to do would be to avoid predictions that have absolutely no chance of naturally occurring. But the Hebrew Bible does the exact opposite. The Bible predicts that the Jews will be forced into exile from the land of Israel to all four corners of the world for a very long time. And then it clearly predicts that eventually they will return at the end of days. This is completely unnatural and never has and never will occur to any other nation on earth. But that's not the end of it. After they return, it predicts that all the nations of the world will be against them. Not one single nation, not even nations at the far ends of the world, none of them will make peace with the fact that the Jews control the land of Israel and specifically Jerusalem. This also makes no sense. Every single nation on earth is entitled to a country except the Jews. Why? Who would be able to predict such a crazy scenario that makes absolutely no sense? But it goes even further. Although all the nations will be against the Jews, there are two who are primary forces who actually attack the Jews. One is the superpower of the world, and the other is Iran. Sam, can you please tell me how somebody can predict that 2,500 years ago? The Dead Sea Scrolls are over 2,000 years old, so nobody wrote it later and then convinced all the Jews and Christians that it was written earlier. And as crazy as it may sound, even though the prophet predicts that America and Iran will be tactical allies in a war against Israel, at the very same time, Zechariah predicts that they will kill each other. Who in their right mind would predict such a crazy scenario? On top of that, the prophet predicts that they will be assisted in their war against the Jews of Israel by the leaders of the Jews of Israel. Now that is so beyond nonsensical that we can never even have imagined how this will play out. But it has, and it's playing out as we speak. The United States has and continues to enable Iran in its genocidal ambitions against the Jewish state. Thanks to the Biden administration, hundreds of billions have been added to the coffers of the Iranians to enable them to fund their own terrorist IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and to fund and train hundreds of thousands of killers to fight the Jewish state. This, of course, includes Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and scores of other militias located in Syria and Iraq, and even in Jordan, and even in Yehuda and Shomron. And, of course, these funds allowed Iran to continue their nuclear program uninhibited. And all this is thanks to the Biden administration. Uncle Joe has also put enormous pressure on Bibi to severely limit any response to the Iranian unprecedented attack on Israel. There's absolutely no question that Iran would not be a threat to Israel without the ongoing assistance and encouragement of the United States. But at the same time, they hate each other and kill each other. It's just so weird, it's hard to wrap your head around this. But the diabolical alliance of these two tactical allies, who actually hate each other, would never succeed without the help of the Israeli government, which sees itself as a vassal of the United States and never did and never will dare do anything bold to protect its citizens without the explicit permission of the White House. In fact, the Israeli government is the primary entity responsible for building up Hamas and enabling October 7th. They left Gaza in 2005 and in the process caused enormous suffering to 10,000 holy Jews who dedicated their lives to build 20 beautiful communities. The chances that the Gazans would be transformed by this so-called disengagement, which was actually an unprecedented surrender to our enemies, the possibility that this incredibly irresponsible and criminal endeavor would actually transform the Gazans into a peace-loving people was less than zero. But the Israeli government did it anyway. And after Hamas officially took over governing Gaza, it was the Israeli government that ensured that billions continued to flow into Gaza from Qatar, from Turkey, and all the Western countries, including, of course, the United States. Billions of dollars that the Israelis knew full well was being used directly to build a massive terror army right under their nose. The Israeli government watched for 15 years as the massive array of tunnels was being built, and they knew full well that all the money was going towards the single-minded goal of eventually attacking the Jews of Israel. October 7th was no surprise. The Israeli government was fully aware what Hamas was doing right under their nose. They heard every single conversation and read every text message. They had drones and satellites watching every phase of the massive buildup of Hamas military capabilities and tunnel infrastructure. Yet they continued to let it happen. Now let me read the verses in the prophecies because I could see from the look on your faces that some of you are skeptical that it actually says 
the things I just mentioned. Zechariah 12 talks about the current war of Armageddon. Listen to what he says in verse 2. The Jews will also join the siege of Jerusalem. I didn't make that up. Take a look for yourself. This is so outrageous that the prophet repeats it again in verse 14. He says, Judah will battle against Jerusalem. This highly improbable scenario where the leaders of a nation themselves are major participants in a battle against their own citizens never happened and never will happen with any other nation on earth. Then he continues, all the nations on earth will gather against her. You get that? Every single nation on earth will support this war against the Jews. Who could have predicted such a crazy thing, that every single nation on earth will gang, on, gang up on the tiny little Israel? Zechariah continues in verse 4, On that day, declares God, I will afflict every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. Now today we don't fight wars with horses and riders. In order to stop horses and riders from attacking, God would confuse them. But in modern day warfare, God will find other ways to make sure that the missiles and drones fired at Israel will not reach their targets. The prophet continues, But I will watch over the house of Judah. They will consume all the surrounding nations to the right and left. Hey, wait a minute. In the time of Zechariah, there was no nation to the left of Israel. That means on the west. There was just the Mediterranean Sea. The ancient Philistines no longer existed. They had totally disappeared as a distinct ethnic group by then. So how did the prophet know at the end of days there will be an independent nation called Gaza to the left of Israel, which would be extremely hostile? Zechariah continues in chapter 13, verse 8. Throughout the world, declares God, two-thirds will be cut off and die, but a third will remain. I will bring that third into fire and refine them as one refines metal and examine them as one examines gold. Do you realize what he's predicting here? The entire world will be guilty of supporting in one way or another the war against the Jews. How did the prophet make such a prediction? How did he know every single nation on earth would turn against Israel? Now, do you really think that two-thirds of mankind will be wiped out? The God I believe in doesn't do things like that. He has pity on animals and, some, and forbids us to cause them pain. So why would he wipe out two-thirds of mankind just because they're deeply misinformed about what is really going on in the Middle East? Of course, the evil monsters of Hamas, Hezbollah, the mullahs of Iran, and all other despicable Jew-hating Amalekites don't deserve to walk on this planet. But as far as the rest of the world, even though they are against Israel for one reason or another, nonetheless, they don't deserve to die. So let me share with you an interpretation inspired by the Lubavitcher Rebbe who was born on this very day of 11 Nisan in 1902. When God says he will wipe them out, he means that he will wipe clean their distorted perception of reality, and he'll transform them into decent human beings. The fact that they couldn't do this on their own, and it was God that had to clean up the mess they made of their minds and hearts, means that they will get no credit for this transformation, and they will be quite ashamed of their foolishness, and of their inability to differentiate between light and darkness and good and evil. This is the deeper meaning of chapter 14, verse 12. Please take a look because we have no time to elaborate. However, there is another one-third of mankind who are not so messed up, even though they too are not supporting the Jews for one reason or another. This group can be inspired and assisted to transform themselves. This is a much more meaningful transformation than the one imposed on two-thirds of mankind against their will. Now I want to point out the obvious. The two-thirds and the one-third are referring to those who are in one way or another supporting the Jews uh, and not supporting the Jews in our battle against Hamas and Iran. There are many, many righteous Gentiles who are going out of the way to show unlimited and unrestrained support for Jews and for Israel. These pure and holy souls do not need to be refined through any process like the one-third mentioned above because they're already pure and righteous they will most definitely share in the glorious future of the Jewish people. There are so many of them, but I, I want to mention just a few. Douglas Murray, Colonel Richard Kemp, John Spencer, Victor Hansen, John Bolton, Richie Torres, Tony Perkins, Stephen Thompson, Patricia Heaton, and the righteous Christians who run the podcast called The Israel Guys. There are many, many more, and I do ask their forgiveness for not mentioning them by name. And of course, there are probably millions out there who are not known, but in their hearts and prayers, they're fully behind the Jewish people. I have bumped into many of them in supermarkets and airports. 
They came over to me just to say they support the Jews and pray for us. However, out of the 8 billion people on this planet, all these righteous Gentiles, even if they number in the millions, are still a minority. The prophet continues in 14, verse 13. On that day, it will be a great confusion from God in their midst. They will grab hold of each other's hand, with each other's hand raised against the other. Here the prophet clearly predicts what I mentioned earlier, that the nations who are attacking Israel will at the same time be killing each other. This is truly a crazy prediction, one which we are witnessing before our eyes. As I mentioned earlier, America and Iran are ganging up together against Israel and at the same time killing each other. It's really crazy stuff. In Yechezkel 38, 21, this prediction is repeated because it is so outrageously unnatural and unpredictable. He predicts that during the wars of Gog and Magog, men will turn their swords against one another. I need to stop here because it's getting too long and everybody's busy preparing for Pesach, except myself because we're going to be spending Yontif with our amazing children and grandchildren in Chicago. But let me end with this. One thing is very clear. We are in the midst of a very final stages before the redemption. We will soon witness the concluding prophecies in Yechezkel chapter 39. Therefore, Hashem says, Now I will cause Jacob to return from exile and will have mercy on the whole house of Israel. I will be sanctified through them as many nations watch. They will know that I am God who exiled them to the nations, and I will gather them to the land and will leave none of them in exile. I will no longer hide my face from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel. So says Hashem. Have a meaningful Pesach.